Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we are thrilled to have Yishai Mansour here. Um, he's at Tel Aviv, and he's been at many places. Um, he's now spending a day a week in the um, Israel outlet of MSRNE, uh, and he will be talking about implementing the wisdom of the crowd. Thank you very oh, oops. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much, Jennifer. So this is a joint work with Ilan Kramer and Moti Perry. Each of them has a double affiliation, like any economist should do. <laughs> okay. So, so let me start by sort of saying where we started this research and, and what we wanted sort of to understand. So so you have in many places sort of things that you you are gathering information in order to make decisions. We really started this by looking at report cards. So this is sort of an example of, of healthcare report card in which you're trying to sort of help people make educated decision by, by conveying information about, I think this is the case of HMO. So you're giving some information out, how good are those places, how well are they doing. And the general idea is that it's just the popular idea is that the higher transparency you'll, you'll get, the better it's going to be for society. So, so of course, if there is a report card, you do have an incentive to improve your quality. And it does give information to, to the users. Of course, there is also a flip side to report cards, and this is especially sort of in hospitals, that you really get an incentive to game the system. So for example, if you are reporting on their success rate on operations, what would really happen is that you'll try to take the easy cases, try to avoid the hard cases in order to overcome it. Then they'll have a few categories of cases, and then you'll try to take the easy cases in each category. Okay. So this is one example of what we'll be, be looking at. Another example. I think sort of most of you are familiar with TripAdvisor, right? So TripAdvisor is sort of collecting information from users and then sort of sharing it with other users. But I think the most important feature of TripAdvisor is sort of its ranking algorithm. In some sense, it's a, okay, at least when I use it, and my guess is that almost all of you when you use it, you don't really read the 1,000th hotel in London but you sort of browse from the top. When you look at the hotel, you look at its rank. So really, the most important information here is the rank. And this is really a proprietary algorithm. They don't describe how they do it. But it's not only propriety, but in some sense, it's self-enforcing. So there are studies that are done. And basically, if you are getting higher on the rank, then your revenue is significantly go going up. The difference between being number one and number 10 is highly significant in your revenue. So a hotel would really feel uh, its revenue going down when it's going down and the other way around. And now, <clears throat> the point that we, what we would like to look at is that in some sense, what the way that we would look at the question is from, from the TripAdvisor eyes, right? So the TripAdvisor is giving a ranking. But in some sense, the ranking is self-enforcing. But he, is, he would like to induce some exploration, right? So he would like to check new restaurants. He would like to, to test new things. So I think in restaurants and hotels, sort of people feel that, OK, some people are sort of more obliged to do it by themselves. So you claim it's different for TripAdvisor if a restaurant makes a no, job the quality I, goes up and not down? No, 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 no. Think of, of a fairly new restaurant, right? It got five great reviews. 
should it be number one? Probably not. But you would like sort of to send people to try it out. I think the next example would sort of push the point even harder. Okay. <clears throat> this is a, a GPS navigation system called Waze. I think it was sold recently to Google. And, and here is the idea here. So the idea here is that people have GPS. GPS is basically your cell phone, if you have one. And, and when you are driving, you just turn it on. It gives you a recommendation which route to take from one place to the other. How does it give a recommendation? Oh, there are many people who are using it. So basically, it gets live report from all the cell phones of the people which are using it. And based on this, it computes the shortest path. But here comes the sort of the point again. At some point, you need to send people on different routes, on routes that you're not sure that they are good. There is high congestion in one route. You need to send them on a different route. So this is the only case in which we sort of have an interview of the CEO saying, from time to time, we need to take a fraction, a small fraction of the people, and send them on routes on which we are not sure how good they are. OK. If they do it all the time to everyone, probably they wouldn't be successful. If we do it sort of a little bit of a time to a little bit of the user, they can get away with it. And it's, it's sometimes it's, it's like, if you think about it, it's inherent that you need to do something like this. Some people need to sacrifice their time so other people will know how to drive. <laughs> OK. So, so this was three motivating examples. And, <clears throat> And in all of them, sort of the agents need to select. They need to select hospitals. They need to select doctors, hotels. And, and sort of we'll assume sort of a Bayesian model when I'll get to, to, to sort of the more precise modeling issue. So there will be some known prior of success that they, are, that they have. An agent would be becoming sort of arriving one after another. And each one would make one simple decision. Think about the ways example of the traffic. Right? So each one is going to choose one traffic route and really drive it home. So each agent will make one decision and gets reward depending on the outcome. So the individuals are going to be strategic in a sense that they, they would like to maximize the reward. They would be sort of aware of what the system is doing. They would be aware why the system is recommending what it's recommending. And then they be sort of selecting the best thing given all the information that they have. Our perspective would be trying to look from the planner perspective. The planner perspective, it would like sort of to implement the better alternative. Right? So you can think of it as, on one side as a government regulator who is really trying to, to maximize social welfare as its goal. You can also think of, like, like, if you think about TripAdvisor, and in fact, any internet company which is sort of working on advertising, it really does also maximize the social welfare, because it wants to maximize the user satisfaction. And maximizing the, user, the overall user satisfaction is maximizing the social welfare. So, so where does this differ from, from sort of many other work? So notice here that the agents are both producers and consumers. They produce information because when they take action, they reveal information. They are consumers because they decide which action to take. And this would be at the heart of what we will try to understand. <coughs> so, yes. Yes. Okay. So the main resource question is, would be, what is the planner optimal policy? So before I'm saying what is the planner optimal policy, we need to think, what can the planner do? So the planner can decide how to reveal information. Think about the report card. It's the easiest thing. You have a template. The template is really saying what kind of information am I giving out and what kind of information I'm not giving out if it's not in the template. We'll be mainly looking on a system with no monetary incentives, everything sort of very nicely and naturally extends when you have money. <laughs> this is not the, basically, this is not the issue. <laughs> Didn't say that money is not the issue. <laughs> Sham is, okay. 
the main motivation of the planner, he wants to induce exploration. He wants to induce exploration because he's thinking about the long run. Okay, so think that there is really, really a very large number of users and he would really like to find a better alternative that is better for everyone. Okay, so, so we'll be looking at the optimal policy and then we'll ask a question which is sort of unfamiliar usually when people are doing optimal things. We'll, we'll ask how good is the optimal? Okay, so how good is the optimal? It's optimal. But in a sense, what we'll try to measure the optimality is that compare how much the planner is losing by the fact that he needs to convince people to do the best action compare whether he could just come up and tell them what to do. And we'll see that basically the regret, this would be the difference between those two, is going to be very small. In fact, it's going to be a constant. What about the regret of the user? But you're giving the regret of the planner. But right. I, as a user, I also have a regret because if you didn't induce me to help you explore, then I actually would get there faster. I would get the fastest route. So, so, so basically, we'll build it in such a case that the agents are indifferent between exploring and not exploring. This, this would be okay, of course. We'll, we'll need to, to build in such a way that the agents do have an incentive to explore. So now I'm starting to take a few models into, a few steps into the model. So I'm going to use a multi arm bandit as my basic model for decision making. I'm going to talk about multiple actions. In fact, today we're just going to talk about two actions and there's going to be a prior over the action rewards. And there is a repeated interaction, right? So, so, so for those of you who are less familiar with multi-arm band, it's really what is that you have now a trade-off between exploring and exploiting, right? On the one hand, you, you got some information so you can sort of get the highest reward that you can. On the other hand, there is value of gaining more information. So in this Bayesian setting, there is well-known algorithm that gets the optimal policy and the discounted return, which is called the Gittins index. I think I wrote it incorrectly, but fine. I think it's the name without an apostrophe. Okay. Let me say a few words from my personal perspective. Why is it interesting for me to do this research? So I worked. Uh, quite a bit on multi-arm bandits as the basic uh, uncertainty modeling, which is both exists in machine learning, called online learning there, and exists in, in game theory. I think sort of the trade of the basic trade off of exploration versus exploitation is, is very nice and cleanly dealt with in multi-arm bandits. But here we are sort of introducing a new dimension of incentives. And this is sort of one of the things that really gets me excited about this work. In this work, we will are looking at actions which are controlled by strategic agents in sort of in a related work yet to be written. <laughs> we are looking on expert advice in which experts which are giving you the advice have incentives about the outcome that you will select. Let me. Yes, yes. Exploring and exploiting in the multi arm bandit is not separable, right? Actions can involve both actions, right? Right. You can disappear in the Gittins, right? What? You can disappear in the Gittins. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but, but conceptually. So you think about it. Right. right. I think if you try to explain to someone why are you doing yeah. this, right? But, but, but it's right. Ayod is right. It's really usually intermingled, the two. <clears throat> Let me give sort of just a startup example, and then I'm going to define the model and give a more detailed example. So let's take just the two extremes. What would happen if we give no information to the agents as a planner? If we give no information, then it's clear that all the agents would, would prefer the a priori better action. No exploration in this case. And of course, sort of, if the a priori better action is not always better, we have a problem. Okay. 
this, this was clearly that it, it shouldn't be the right answer. But let's look in sort of a full transparency. What happens if we have full information? The point is that full information is also extreme. It, it induces a very limited amount of exploration. Let me give a very simple example, and we sort of a more detailed example would come later. So think that we have like two actions. One action has a uniform prior between minus one and plus two, so it's slightly positive on average. And action two has a prior uniform between minus two and plus two, so on average it's zero, right? So action one a priori is a better action. So the first agent is going to do action one. The second agent, now he knows what the outcome of the first action agent was. So if the first agent got a positive value for the first action, the second agent will, will use the, the first action. So in this case, right, in case that the first action is bigger than zero, we are not going to explore. And still we have a very good chance that the second action is better. Very good meaning a constant, at least. Okay, so full information, right. Okay. The payoff is randomly drawn every time. Okay, 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 so, so I need to specify it, right. So, so the payoff is drawn only once, right. And if you reuse the action, you're going to get the same payoff, right. Okay, so now it's, it's time sort of to define our model and sort of see where we are going. So we're going to use a very simple setting. We're going to have just two actions. Each action has a fixed unknown reward, which is going to be selected through a random variable, either R1 for action one, R2 for action two. A priori, we assume that action one is better than action two. And now we are going to have a sequence of agents, T agents, which we are going to arrive sequentially. Each agent will know exactly its place in the order in which it arrives. And each one of them is going to select one action and get the reward of the action it selected. All the agents are risk neutral, meaning they would just like to maximize the return. So the agent optimal policy is, is, is very clear. Given everything that he has access to, all the information that he can observe, he's going, he can compute what the expected value of action one given this information was the expected value of action two given this information, and he's going to select the one which is having the higher payoff. Okay. The interesting thing that we are going to look at is how does a planner need to plan its action? So the planner is controlling the information, and he would like to optimize the expected sum of payoffs over all the user. Agents are going to be incentive compatible, like I, the previous slide. And we are assuming that there are no payments. At the end, we are going to, I'm going to say a few words how, how payments are incorporated in getting the optimal policy a very similar way. So the planner action is sort of, he can give to each agent a certain message, a certain amount of information about the past, and then observe what the agent does and gain some more information. So the, we are, of course, we are assuming that the agents do know the planner policy, and they are using the fact that they know the planner policy. And the goal of the planner is to maximize the sum of the payoff. So it's a social welfare maximization problem. Yes? Yes. So I think the planner is, is writing a, a code program, and the code program is published, right? Information uh, public or uh, every agent no. gets a, a tailored piece of information? So, right. most of the talk would be about a private communication model in which when you get it, the message, only you get it. I, I'm going to remark a few things in the extension what happens in the public information. Basically, when I give you information, everyone can, else can see it. <coughs> Our result, okay. Private recommendations, yes. Once, one action per agent. And what's public? Can, can, they, can the planner just hide what everyone yes. else got? Yes. Okay. Yes. But then they will just use that for your. Right. Right. 
they're going to give you just a planner that's just sending one signal, which is which arm you're shooting. Right. So, 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 yeah. So this would be sort of the first step, right? So we can use the revelation principle and just give a recommendation of which arm. Private recommendations, so, so basically we'll, we'll basically build the optimal policy. I'm not sure what we'll have time to build it, but you'll have to trust me at some point. And we are going to sort of look on, on what is sort of the regret of this policy, and we are going to see that it's constant regardless of the number of agents. It will depend on the prior, sort of. There are extensions sort of to other models that we can discuss. Basically, what happens sort of if if I don't know my place in the queue, maybe I know that it's a random permutation. This would be an easy case, because in this case, the planner and the agent uh, goals are aligned. But we'll get to it later. We we'll also can sort of analyze a case in which there are blocks. So, so I know that I'm in the first block, or the second block, or the third block. But, but I don't know, know my place in the block. We'll do, we will talk about monetary incentive. It's not going to really change the policy significantly. I did mention the full information, and sort of I'm going to comment about public recommendation, which is sort of, in this case, it's much more limited model than the private information, which has a much richer structure. In, 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 in a nutshell, in public recommendation, you cannot really implement the first base. You cannot really guarantee that the regret is going to be very small. There are only two actions. Uh... Because I don't know how to do three. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 no, it's not important, but I don't know why. <laughs> Being sincere. <laughs> so TripAdvisor is a no, I didn't say recommendation, that... right. and, wait, and the, 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 the traffic thing is a private recommendation just to So I think, it. okay, so it's not clear. Or maybe TripAdvisor Trip is giving me something right. different than it's giving Christian. Yes, and it may be, okay, and, and, you, and, and you can think of agents as, as, as uh, it could, you can think of you, or you can think at Tuesday 10 p.m., right? Right. right. So, so it can switch recommendation, let's say, maybe not every second, but every... Wait, so agent could be the host? No. Could be, no, no, agent no. is an agent. Agent is, is the really person, awesome. yeah. Okay. Yes. So it can be giving different people different recommendations, saying it's not based on the user, but it's based on the time. Right. And then it's almost like a private recommendation. Okay. Now I'm going to take a risk and talk about an unrelated work, which has a similar <laughs> effect. I love it, but, but sort of I have very much hope not to lose you. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, okay, how many people know what's information cascading? Okay, so here's the idea in information cascading. In information cascading, think that you have sort of two arms, and you need to decide whether there is more blue balls or more red balls, right? And now the agents come sequentially, like in our case, one by one. Each one puts his hand, looks for a ball, takes out a ball, and just sees it's the color of a ball, and puts it back in. And then he declares what he thinks is, is the majority color, okay? Now, <clears throat> now the, what would happen in this setting, right? So those who are not familiar. <laughs> so you see, when you're declaring, you've also seen what he previously yes, declared. Yes, right. right. So here you see what he previously declared, right. So, so, so the real question is, it's clear that if we have a very large number of people, if they all just said the color that they saw will make the right decision. But in this setting, okay, so it, let's say that the majority is blue. But there is a fair chance that the first guy sees red and then he says red, right? Now there is a fair chance that the second guy also, let's say, sees red and he says red. Nothing that astonishing up to now. But the third guy is really Regardless of what he's going to pull out of the bag, he's going to say red. Because you know, two agents saw red, he saw blue, he thinks it's more likely to be red. And this is the cascading effect. The cascading effect is, is really the, the fact that the agents are ignoring their information. Okay, 
this was used in order to explain bubble and burst in the stock market mm -hmm. as a motivation example. Okay. The amazing thing is that agents would sort of ignore their private information and just sort of use the publicly available. It seems sort of similar in the fact that agents are making decisions one by one, but the big difference is that sort of we are looking from a planner perspective. And here the agents are really about the information that the other agents gave them. In our case, it's sort of the information that the planner is planning to give them. Okay. Okay. So let's start sort of, I'll try to give a very sort of. What? Model. Not, not here, in the, you can go ahead. But okay. in the model, when you start the game. Yeah, there is prior. Bayesian. There's Bayesian, but are they, they're just arbitrary? Like one reward can be far more rewarding than the other? Let's, this is this slide. That's Just a second. This is, you're talking about this slide, this sham. <laughs> okay. It's sham predicted, right? I cannot do a, any prior, but, but I sort of would be able to almost handle a very large class. And, and sort of this is sort of a bad example. Assume that action one gives always a zero reward. And action two is slightly negative. But it's sort of uniform between minus two and plus one. So it's slightly negative. Now, <clears throat> now what the agents are going to do? The first agent is going to do action one. What is the second agent going to do? Well, he knows that the first action agent did action one and got zero. He knows that the planner doesn't have any information, really. So he's going to ignore the planner recommendation and do action one, the third, fourth, fifth, and so on. So in this case, the planner doesn't have any influence. Okay. What do we need to assume? We need to assume that about the priors that there is some probability, right, there is some probability that the first action is worse than the average of the second action. This is the only thing that we need. So there is some realization of the first action that would cause you to prefer the second action if you knew it. No, the expectation is always The expectation is higher. So why would agent one ever choose? No, because he knows that maybe the first agent already. The first agent. We didn't get to it. Let, let's. He's got a delta function right. for first one and so right. kind of yes. that, that's the example he's looking at he's looking at the delta function right. on the first one right. and there needs to be some real and that's why right. he's saying there he's so he's trying to avoid the delta function by right. saying there's some realization right. so, so I need that there is some probability that the first action gets gives you a work so basically I need the case that in if I tell you the outcome of the first action there is some outcome, maybe tiny probability that you say, oh, then I prefer the second action. No, I'm not going to lie. Right. There's no, it has nothing to do with lying. But, but sort of, even in, like in the full information, think there is some chance that someone would do the second action. Okay. Just for simplicity, but I'm not sort of the proofs, it's easier to think about full support in both actions, no must point, but it's not going to be important. And you can and relax then, that as long as the first action is not. Right. No, no. I, okay, this I really need. This is sort of. What? It's necessary, because without this, without this. can give you other ways to resolve this. No, no. Okay, you can change the entire model. But, but you see, if, if, if this probability is exactly zero, it means that all the agents are going to do action one. It has a higher expectation. Yeah, no, that's right. So you need to rule this out right. by some sufficient condition. Okay. So I'll try sort of to give an o a general overview, and then we'll see how we're doing with time and seeing whether we can talk more about proof. So here's how the opt. Yeah. Right. I'm going to talk about a stochastic model at the end in the extension. Right. For now, it's a very simple model. Once you did an action, it's realized and it's kept fixed. When are you going to, 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 to see the second action? Yes, I got everything if I took every action once. Yeah, but how would you convince the second guy to do this? Yeah, right. Yes. Yes, right. This is different from the usual method. Yes. 
Well, it's not different. It's sort of it's, there's one realization. OK, so here's how the optimal policy would look like. And it's not surprising. But the first agent does always action one. We agree. And now this, for the other agent, what we need to, what we'll, we'll have a sequence of threshold. And for each agent, it has hit its threshold. If we already sampled both actions, we'll always recommend him the better action. <coughs> if not, when this is satisfied, he's going to be the first one to be recommended action two, and he's going to do it. Otherwise, he's going to be recommended action one. OK? Right. So, so the goal is, it would be sort of to convince you that this is indeed the optimal policy. But looking at it, we can say a few properties of the optimal policy. OK, so first of all, like I think, I don't remember, right, it's going to be enough to give recommendations. We don't need to have arbitrary mess messages, basically the revelation principle. When you will set up the incentive constraint, for you probably now it's sort of how to see how the incentive constraints are going to look like. But they are going to be tight, right? So you would like to induce the most exploration that you can. Now, it's not clearly immediate that this is what you want to do. Because you're going to have, you might have a trade-off between exploring and exploiting, right? Because you want to maximize the sum of, of the rewards. Generally, what you'll do is you'll explore low value before high value. This is the threshold function. And the intuition is that you'll, you'll have sort of a trade-off between two potential reasons of being recommended the worst action. One reason is that you are the first guy to do it, and you don't want to do it. The other thing is maybe the second action is already sampled. So maybe it's good for me to do it. This is the incentive constraint that we'll build upon in order to, to build our optimal policy. OK. Let me start with an example, and I hope that this example sort of So this is really makes, where the new aspect of the problem yes. comes in, is that you have these two different, now that you have incentives, you have these two different reasons for exploration. Yes. Right? And that's the yeah. OK. So let's set up an example. And through the example, I'm hoping sort of to get most of the ideas across. So, so assume that we have two action. Action one is usually is better. Action one is uniform between minus one and plus five. So it has a positive reward on average. Action two is between minus five and plus five. It is zero on average. And let's assume that we have a very large number of agents. I, I sort of don't want to get into the small number effect. So, so here's the picture that we have. The first action has an average of two. The second has an action of an average of zero. So in the full transparency, agent one will choose the first action. And if the first action realization is lower than zero, then the second action will choose the second action. Otherwise, everyone will going to choose the first action. So I think essentially we have it's going to be like one over six probability of really exploring the second action, but you have a very high probability of not doing it. Okay. So let's try to see what we can do. How can we convince the second agent to explore more? This is a picture that we had. And now, <coughs> when you are giving a recommendation, right, rather than telling him what was the outcome of the first agent, we can just tell him that the first agent outcome is, let's say, less than one. Right? So now condition, so now when we come and tell him, OK, the first agent outcome is less than one, condition on this information its expected value is zero, right? Because you know that the first agent is between plus one and minus one. The second one is between plus five and minus five. They both have an expectation of zero, so he's indifferent, right? So we are already more efficient. We are more efficient in the sense we are exploring more, right? And if we have a very large number of agents, we can do better. Now, the interesting thing will start with the third agent. <coughs> mm -hmm. The third agent, 
we are going to recommend him the second action in two different cases. The first case is if we already know the two actions. So if the reward of the first action is below one, the second agent already used this action, and therefore, we are going to recommend him the better action. Definitely, this is a place in which he would be delighted to follow the recommendation. The second case is sort of, we can sort of now stretch. And this is the, the X is sort of saying, OK, we need to compute how much can we stretch the fact that we are asking him to explore. See, if X is 0, then it's clearly he will follow the recommendation. And now when we start to stretching it, we can stretch it up to some point, which the incent incentives will allow us, and sort of the number is not important here. So you can stretch it here in this example to three point something. And then the fourth, and so in this example, the fourth agent will sort of finish the exploration. So all the exploration that needs to be done will be done with the fourth agent because we don't need to go above five, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Non-monotonic? No, no, just in, in some sense that uh, R1, uh, so, so if, OK, so if R1 was uh, smaller than 1, then you have already uh, right. invested yeah. first. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you assume that uh, the uh, agent knows uh, the set of possible messages that are given by the uh, planner? Because the agent know, if, uh, if, the uh, agent knows the planner's algorithm. For example, if the reward R1 is 0 0.9. What? If the reward R1 is 0 0.9. OK. So you're gonna, uh, the planner is going to tell uh, the second agent. Do action two. R1 is less than 1. Yes. But if he says that, then uh, maybe the second agent knows that the reward is not less than 0. Because if he were less than 0, maybe the planner would have told him that it's less than 0. No, yeah, but instead no, no, of no, less no. than 1. He knows stuff. Right. He knows the algorithm. The algor he knows that the algorithm says, if R1 less than 1, okay. recommend action 2. Okay. Right. All the agents know that. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. yes. OK. So, so the main thing is really to prove that this algorithm is, is the optimal one. I'll try to give you in a few minutes a high-level idea. I'm not sure that we'll really have t time to do the actual proof. So, so the main technical difficulty is really proving that it's exactly optimal. Exactly optimal meaning that it, is that it both maximizes the sum of the rewards and it's incentive compatible. The basic argument is not surprising. You would like sort of to argue that that if it's not a threshold, then you can improve. But what does it mean that it's not a threshold? It means that, let's say, agent 5 is sort of exploring at a low value, and agent 4 is exploring at a high value, and you'd like sort of to swap them. But you need sort of to do this swap in a very delicate way to make it work. Yes? Is there a priori, I think we, our proof shows it. Okay. Uh, a priori, it's not clear. Okay. Right. Everything that they say also applies to the discounted return. The same analysis would work for the discounted return, and the same sort of high-level motivation would work. So the fact of the theorems even, you can basically show them. <clears throat> so what we need to show, we, we need to show really two things when we do this swap. We can, what we'll do technically is it will show that we maintain the incentive compatibility. So basically, the agents, the two agents and everyone else that is affected are still going to follow the recommendation. And the recommendation will only increase the social welfare. Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm going to do now is going to give a very high level overview of sort of how the proof works. So the basic properties is, first of all, I mentioned this sort of Recommendations are always sufficient. It's basically the revelation, very similar to the proof of the revelation principle. So rather than sending arbitrary information, you can just give recommendations to the agents, and the agents are going to follow 
the recommendations. Mm -hmm. The next step is that we can define the optimal policy as a partition policy. What do I mean by a partition policy? Partition policy is meaning that I take all the values of the first action, and basically just based on the value of the first action, I'm going to tell you which is going to be the first agent to, to explore. So a partition policy is a mapping of values of the first agent, in, of, of the first action, into an, an agent number which is going to explore, or maybe f no agent is going to explore. What? Explore is meaning that you are the first agent to try action two. Okay? And, and once we know that both, both action will always recommend the better one. Right. So the next step is, is we were sort of establishing that the optimal policy has to be look like this. Essentially well, what we are saying is that once we know both realization, we are always going to recommend the better action. <laughs> And it makes sense definitely from social ma welfare maximization. But what you need to think for a second about is that also from the incentive constraint, it makes sense. Because if I give you always a better recommendation, I'm just making the incentives. Like I'm working for the agent, not against them. OK. So once we sort of build a, that the optimal policy is a partition policy, what we, we can sort of divide the values, partition the values of the first reward this is where agent, agent four would be the first to try action two. This is agent three. Agent four might have like a few different intervals in which he's, he's going to try because I'm, I'm yet not, and there is, might be interval in which we decide not to explore for some reason. Like agent infinity. Question? No explosion is like agent infinity or something. Yeah. Yes, they, we made it T plus one, right? <laughs> infinity, <laughs> but yes. Okay, when we're talking about incentive compatibility, usually we need to take care of two constraints, right? We can recommend action one, and we can recommend action two. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, in this case, we just care about action two. Okay, and, and what we show is that basically, if you build an in something which is incentive compatible for action two, meaning that every time that I recommend you action two, you're going to do it, you're going to follow also the recommendation of action one. And the intuition is, a priori, action one is better. Now I'm taking away a fraction in which action two is better. So I'm making action one even stronger in some sense. Right. So, so not surprisingly, what we need to concentrate on is only on, on action two. We really need to, to concentrate on convincing the agents of doing the worst a priori action. <coughs> Now, the next step is sort of, we, we understand what the, the incentive constraints are, and we need to make sh what we'll show is that the optimal policy is tight. Technically, we'll also need to show that the second agent really explores anything below, any value of the first action which is below the expected value of the second action. This is also intuitive because if I give him a recommendation that telling that the first action is sort of below the expected value of a second action, he would be gladly willing to explore it because the expectation is below. Okay. And generally what we'd like to show is that we'll explore low value before high value, establishing that the optimal policy is a threshold policy. And this, this would mean that we'll, we'll show that the optimal algorithm would look in the way that I described before. The first agent is going to do action one, and then starting from the t second agent onward, if we know both actions, we'll recommend the better one. Otherwise, we have a threshold per agent, and depending on this threshold, we decide whether to ask him to do action two. Otherwise, we do on, on the action one. And the intuition is that the trade-off between those two things are really it's really what's driving the exploration. Because agents are not sure whether they are asked to do action two for the first time or because it's better. This is how we can sort of convince more and more agents. To, this, is, this is how we can convince 
more and more, to get higher and higher values of R1 to, to be explored with action two. <coughs> okay, so the threshold optimality is sort of the main difficulty. Okay, I think we did this. Okay, so now, what is going to be the performance of the threshold the policy? So if action one is a better action, it's very simple. Just one agent, is, at most one agent is going to explore action two, and that's it. Okay, what happens if action two is better? So the point is that there is going to be a constant, and the constant sort of, I think in the next slide I'll show you, would depend only on the prior distribution. But there is going to be only a constant number of agents that are going to use action one before we'll get to action two. And this would give us a constant regret compared to always using the better action event. So, so this means that the loss of a planner compared to someone who in advance knew the better action is just going to be a constant and it's independent of a number of agents. This is the more surprising fact. And the optimal policy is, is really the way that it's built is you think of an infinite number of agents and under the assumption of an infinite number of agents, you, can, you are starting to build, build thresholds, right? So, so except everything up to now I sort of described with an infinite number of agents. Later sort of you need to truncate this because, because if there is only a hundred agents, maybe for a certain f very high value of, of the first action, you don't want to explore the second action, right? Even in the optimal policy. So this is sort of this criteria. This says whether it's worth for you to try if there is only big T minus little t remaining agents, this is how much they can hope to gain, and this is the loss of the next agent. Basically, like the list of reviews is sort of all the negative. He's just disclosing negative information. No, <laughs> right? Yeah, because it's like whenever it's uh, negative is what the planner wants to disclose. No, the planner, the planner is giving recommendation. The no, question. That's effectively telling you, like, what is the information telling you? It's like, oh, the first guy didn't like the thing that was good. No, no, no but but think, you're the third guy, right? <laughs> and it's, then you're doing action two. Right. So you're not sure whether. Uh, it's indeed you're the first guy to try it, or, you're, or he knows it. I think if you're the hundred guy, you're almost certain that you're doing the better action. There's a tiny probability that the first action came out to be extremely high, and he's asking you to explore. But with 99.9 percent, .9%, and if you're let's say, and if you're above this constant, then you know that you're doing the better action. Still true, but isn't the planner basically just disclosing the negative information up to the 99? Well, he's doing no. Either no. telling you that the first guy hit a traffic jam, right. or okay, right. second one is actually really good. Right. As, as, yeah. As, as the agents go, the, the, the disparity is more extreme. So in some sense, uh, yeah. with 99.9 yeah. 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 probability, you're, you're getting the better action, uh, action, and with 0 0.01, you're really get, getting screwed. Because yeah. you're Right. And, and then there is a threshold after which you know that you're getting the better action, regardless of what happens. Okay? And, and, and you can bound sort of the number of agents because, because in some sense, okay, I'm not sure that I can do this slide. Okay. There is a constant amount of exploration that you can induce. And this is sort of, this is, this is sort of what we want it to be non-negative. This is sort of the integral of of the values of R1 below the expected value of, of uh, the second action, and the action two is better. So, so given that R, the first action is below the expected value of the second action, and it's better, how much can you gain? This is sort of how much uh, exploration you are inducing. You can induce more and more as you go along, but this is a minimal, a lower bound. So, so the number of agents that you need to explore is just the difference between the expectation divided by this quantity, because each one is going to contribute at least this much. Um, now it's a good time to ask. 
I think I have like 10 more minutes without going into the detailed proofs. So I'll probably, someone needs to say something to, to help me out. <laughs> Yeah. Question. <laughs> uh, like a, a panel that will lie in order to maximize the, the global revenue. Okay. Lying is impossible in a Bayesian world. What do I mean? <laughs> right. Because. False informations. But I know that he reveals false information, right? No, no. He doesn't reveal false information, right? So. No. So, so, so usually when, when we say it reveals false information, it's like the planner is coming and telling you the outcome of action one was five and it really was three. But then I would know that he's going to, when he tells me that the outcome was five, it's really three. Right? So, so I'm assuming that the agents sort of are aware of what the planner is doing and there isn't sort of something hidden there. It's in the extension that I'm not going to skip. But is it the same idea or does it fundamentally change the, the structure of the problem? I'll keep the question and, and I hope to answer it without you reminding me again. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, you'll know that. Okay. So when you, so I'm thinking that one might want to apply that to things like I go to the hospital, I need and so the doctor says to me, you know, there is this new half-life, and expectation, your survival rate is much bigger, but we don't know it. Mm -hmm. And so you might want to apply that, but then I might say, you know, maybe I actually wait a year, because then you have found out that actually this half-life leads to care and everybody dies on it or whatever. And yeah, so, 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 so right. there is a question of incentives. Where do you want to be in this solution? To, on the other side, yeah. I might have I'm, I am going to talk about it when I talk about the extension, which okay. I'm not going to skip. Right. <laughs> right. Just to answer sort of, like in Israel, there was an amazing case. There was Schneider Hospital, it's a children's hospital. It opened a new facility for liver transplant for kids. And they didn't disclose sort of the success rate. And the parents went to the court, and with the court order, they, they were forced to show. And the reason was that like, they had like five operations. <laughs> they had like, a, and it's like three failed, and the average failure should be one. So it, it was sort of small number. But the effect was amazing. Basically, there aren't any liver operations there anymore, transplant operations. Because, you see, full transparency can play <laughs> in a very delicate way, even in reality, right? So, so I can understand the parents. I can understand the hospital saying, come on, it's not statistically significant, and if you want it in the long run, you need to do it. But I think there are many issues be behind sort of those things. So as I promised, I'm going to talk about a few extensions and then, okay. So the first thing is that we, we I, so far I assume that agents know exactly their place. Mm -hmm. So the relaxation sort of that we can sort of handle is that we can divide the agents into blocks and each agent knows in which, right. Your, your question is, is sort of what happens if the agent decides that he's not an early adopter but, but sort of a late adopter, right? So, so in some sense, we are assuming that he doesn't have control over this. I'm not sure what the answer is, right? Because in, in, in some sense, right, if you sort of auction, right, if, if I'm going to auction the places out, right, the first place is going to be auctioned at a very low price, maybe a negative price. I need to pay someone to be with, right? So, so like the first few guys, like Shem would say, they, are going to, they know that they are going to do the experiment on them. The first guy knows that the planner has no idea which, which one is better, and he's just giving him like one alternative. If, if you go late in the queue, then, then you are 
yeah, I, then the probability, like Rob was saying, that you're going to get the better action is becoming high, but there might be still a small exploration probability. And after some threshold, you know that you're getting the better one. So there is a question here. Yeah. Well, just counting. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. But if you can wait, it's always better to wait. The fact that someone is, early, uh, is an early adopter is usually correlated with the uh, success probability. Uh, early adopters usually have a lower success probability yeah. because they would be uh, desperate cases that uh, have no alternative. A bigger discounting yeah. factor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so if you live on the side sort of the, the hospital example, think about restaurant. <laughs> In which case, <laughs> right. you might, if it's a very bad one, you might risk your life. But, <laughs> but some people sort of are more inclined to try new things on, on sort of shaky ground, and some people are much more conservative. This is like Sham's question about noise. Like in some sense, I'll get to the noise. <laughs> early adopters are not right. exactly the same as the general yes. population, then mm -hmm. what you learn about them is a noisy sound. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so, so in this case, essentially the same things go through. The, the larger the blocks, the better things are, because the less information, really, the agents have about their play. In fact, blocks can only increase the social welfare and reduce the regret. The extreme point is when we have a random permutation. If you don't know your place in the queue, then agents are uh, basically incentives are aligned with the planner incentives. So the planner just takes the optimal policy regarding incent disregarding incentives and runs it. And when you think about it, he, when I'm an agent and I'm coming and trying to see what's the best thing for me, it's the same thing that the planner did, right? The planner computed the same thing as, as, as I'm computing. And therefore, I'm going just to follow his advice because my average reward is the planner average reward. Okay, so this is a simple case. Money. Okay. You're going to talk about mixed strategies or this the mixed strategy? Is this uh, the much, mixed? How much can the planner improve? No, we cannot. This is, the op this is the optimal strategy. The random permutation. In the random permutation, he's, he's taking the optimal policy which disregards incentives. Block. How does it decide when no, there no, is no, no, no. There is no block here. Okay. In the random permutation, it's one huge block. Okay. Go back to the block. How does it tell? Don't go back. I'm, I'm consider. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> if there is a block and I don't know my place in the block. Right. So it's, it's a random permutation in the random block. Permutation. In the so block. It's a mixed strategy. Because he decides whether to choose me or uh, whoever. It's not a mixed strategy. So, so nature sort of gives a mixed permutation. Right. The planner is not deciding that you are going to go first. You are just showing up, and, and now we are sort of assuming what do you know about your place in the line. And the main thing we assume that you know that you are the third, and I was before you, and Jennifer was after me, right? Now we are saying, oh, there is a block, the three of us, we are not sure which one is which, but we know that we are the, th the first three. No, no, so, so not knowing meaning that you know that you are number 100 to number 200, and it's equally likely each place. It's uniform. With yeah, uniform. Yeah. Okay. So he, he's assuming uniform. Maybe. Yes. Money transfer. Okay, so, so suppose we can pay the agent. This, uh, the nice thing is that basically the same policy would go through. What the planner would do is invest all of the money that he do in, in the, our simple model in the second agent, up to, up to, to a certain threshold. Same construction, same proof. Everything goes through. I have uh, co-authors that are coming from finance department, <laughs> and so they have to ask the question: What happens when money costs money? So money costs money really means that. Uh, 
in order to have taxes, you have, you, you're not only collecting taxes, but you're spending money to collect the taxes, right? So again, even in this setting, you will have all the money invested in the second agent, and all the other agents are planning as before. Question? No, because because the agent has no private information when he arrives, so I right. can just write a contract with him, which I charge all the surplus upfront from him, and then so, I. So so the question is, how much money do you want to invest? If you want to, if you have enough money, then you can convince the second agent to do the action. If you have a little amount of money, the question is is whether you you sort of give it all to the second agent or give a tiny bit to the second and tiny bit to the third. I, I, I just so. I think perhaps what he's trying to say is that you don't need to invest any money if information costs money. So you earn money by exploring and you have to spend it to get information. No, but that's not what I said. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> question. Let me try to understand the previous question. So we have yes. two questions. Let's first answer. Well, what I'm saying yeah. is I can just charge the agent too for my advice in, in advance and then conditional on what I recommend him, I can give him money for taking action too, and that way I can just make his participation constraint fine. But then you gave him information, the fact that you didn't offer him money to do action two, you gave him information about action one. So you need to be careful how you do it. You need, you, you see, you need to be very careful with the incentives because, I, because if I tell you that, you know what, when I'll ask you to do action two, I'll give you a dollar, when you don't ask me, so you gave me information about action one. So money cannot condition on the actions. That's you can do whatever you like, right? So, so a priori, you can do whatever you like. I'm just saying, if you design such a policy, you need to be careful. Yeah, but I, I could just use kind of a dynamic reward mechanism. Right. But, but, what the, but the result at the end is very simple. So regardless of how you want to divide the money, it's best to take all the money that you can have and put it in the second agent. Yes, but what I'm saying is that's because Right, ah, but but why? But suppose you have a little bit of money. Why do you? Why is you certain that you cannot give it to someone else and make more, and gain more? So you are saying the planner has some constraint on how much? Yeah, no, yeah, of course, he has a, a budget constraint. But if this budget constraint is only an expectation, he can just. No, no, it's a budget constraint. It's a, it's a hard budget constraint. He has, he has a certain amount of money that he can spend. And the question is, should he spend everything on the second agent, in, which is intuitively true, and it is true, or maybe he can give, let's say, ask a little bit from each agent to explore a little bit more, right? So, so you could think that I give a one cent to each agent and ask each agent to explore a little bit more, or I can give all the one dollar to the second agent and then modify the sequence of I think we are, you give maybe we can take it offline. Yeah. Sham's question. Okay, stochastic payoffs. So, so we did a very simple case in which uh, the, the realization of a function, of an action, once you realize it, it's deterministic. Of course, the most natural thing is, is to say, okay, I have a dis prior distribution of the parameters, but each action is stochastic. So, so if you use this, we can basically get an approximate optimal thing. And by, by doing the following, we can sample each action, let's say one over epsilon square time, take its average, and this is going to be our estimate of the action. And basically now on the same policy, right? So, so, so rather than having a deterministic value, we're sort of sampling a certain amount and, and using it as a deterministic value. Of course, an interesting open problem is what is the exact optimal policy when, when you have stochastic payoff. I think this goes to Madhu question very early on. Why do we need two actions? Um, the topology of three actions sort of much more complicated because 
I think in two actions, at least this is how I explained to myself why we didn't <laughs> able to extend it. In two actions, you know that the first action is going to be done by the first agent. And now the only question is when is the action two is going to be done? And then we are, were able to sort of structure very nicely how, how should the, op the exactly optimal policy would look like. <clears throat> it doesn't happen with three actions anymore. In three actions, sort of, you're going to get a trade-off on when do you want to explore action two and action three, and you might need to interleave them even. Okay, what, what we can sort of, I think, can prove, this is with a question mark, is that if you use basically the same policy in iteration, do action one and two, once you finish finished action one and two, do action the best of one of two with three, and sort of, it will give you an approximate optimal and probably will increase the regret by a factor of the number of action. Again, an open problem here is sort of to find the exact optimal policy, which really would mean interleaving. My guess is that you probably would need to interleave the two actions, the three actions. Okay, public recommendation. So public recommendation means that I'm, when I'm giving a recommendation to Sham, all of you can sort of hear it and see. So the main observation in public recommendations is that we can sort of, since they are public, since everyone knows what everyone got as a recommendation, we can sort of take all the recommendation and sort of push them to the second agent. So this is good news and bad news. The good news is that it's a very simple characterization, but it's also a huge limitation. So it means that with public recommendation, you cannot do what we sort of were able to do with private recommendation. With private recommendation, we were able to implement the first best. We were able to implement sort of a near optimal policy and with a very low regret. Here it really means that you might have a constant regret. Sort of, you can push everything to the second agent, but not more. So we cannot achieve a near optimal performance. Okay. So we've established the optimal policy, which sort of mixes exploration and exploitation. <coughs> In the exploitation, what we are really using, the fact that you are not sure whether you are t exploring or whether you, you are already getting a recommendation for the better action. So exploitation is really you know that action two is better. Exploration, you are the first one to gather information. And I think the high level sort of method of the, this work is that transparency comes at a price. Right? If we go back to where I started, and this is really where we started. Intuitively, the three of us were clear. Right? It cannot be that full information is the right thing to do in general. But, but you can really see here that Although sort of in the popular press you're, you're going to hear otherwise, revealing too much information has a cost. And has a cost, and it's clear where the cost is. Revealing too much information would limit the exploration of the agents that are receiving this information. Okay, and I think I'm done. <laughs> Questions? Yes, there. Social learning literature, which is very closely related without a plan. No? Okay. And there, there comes out the issue of uh, role models. So you take people like from a poor neighborhood, none of them went to law school, mm -hmm. and you immediately try to induce, give stipends. So okay. they go to law school. In case they are capable, then you will observe it, and many people to come will benefit mm -hmm. and become lawyers. Very, society, especially this, this poor group, lost the opportunity. And that comes early on, so it's a very different model. I mean, it's much so, so, so I think the, diff the main difference is when are you observing the outcome. So, so, so I think it's sort of, it was hidden in what I said that I'm giving you a recommendation to do action two, you're doing action two, and I immediately observe the outcome of action of the action before I'm giving Nicole a recommendation. So I'm going to give money, so I right. came back to the 
So wouldn't I give the money to the first green person? So to no, know so right away if he's successful in law school or not? I, but, but the question is sort of, but you have sort of a delay. It's a delayed reward model. Because he has to do something right. else. So you right. see that right. his life outside of law school yeah. is poor. Right. In, in some sense, you need to finish law school, right? <laughs> Which is not immediate. Yeah, no, I'd say it's immediate. Uh, okay, it's immediate. But, uh, but he's forcing, yeah, okay. Right. It, it's a delay reward issue, and this is complicated. Yes. So if the, uh, all agents uh, cared about social welfare instead of their uh, own uh, payoff, then full information would be a good thing. Because it's then. It's going to be a non issue. Why should they get information? I just tell them what to do, then they do it. Like an army, right? <laughs> like, if if being told, if if agents are not strategic and just telling them what to do, they do it. It's fine. Right, there is no right, there is no question. Then you just take what you want to implement and just tell them. Wait, it said right. they're strategic. Right. No, no, they're right. But if they are not strategic, then this issue disappears. Yeah. The the issue will become what is the optimal policy, right? Which would balance exploration and still would balance exploration and exploitation. Yes. What about offering menus of content? So you could say to me, look, if you are not willing to explore, I mean, it's a traffic example, I just give you the standard route, you get no information, and you sort of, you don't have to explore. And I make a contract with you that if you're willing to explore, then I give you better recommendations. Sort of. Hmm. It was filtered. We didn't think about it. So if I don't have a better response. <laughs> so basically, you would be like opting in to be an exploratory agent, yeah. and for that, you would get. Right, but then, then it's going to be like a contract theory. You would like to write the optimal contract. Right. Right, exactly. It seems like things could change a lot if there was a threshold. Like, just do the threshold. Like, meaning, um, my utility, it might have a clip at a certain point. So as it's, everyone doesn't have the same zero point. So, the, so it's like, suppose that I knew As the question of how, if people had different utility functions somehow, uh, mm. uh, the simple ways to, because someone in the restaurant one, it's like, quick, I know this restaurant's good, but I just have no utility. Okay. For, you know, it's just the bar is too low. Okay. So I'm going to explore, even though, like, this one looks worse, like, this one's just not good enough. Okay. <laughs> it's negative for me. Uh, I do, so I think in the... Opt-out kind of a, okay. a criterion with, with uh, uh, service action. I think the reward isn't high enough. It's not going to play this game. Uh, and in that case, like maybe I would try a new restaurant because I know all the other ones the reviews are good, but not good enough. So yeah, okay. So, so, so you are looking for uh, so this is a simplistic model in which the utility is uh, is one dimensional. Yeah, like some. And like, and I think for like the GPS uh, navigation example, it's fair. It's like it's okay to say that most people just care about time. No, but, right, but no, no. But I, I agree that right, for right, restaurants right, and just right, again, right. <laughs> just a second. No, I, I agree that for restaurants and hotels, you're not just looking at no, on no, a one-dimensional right, issue. Right, right. If I need to get there in eight minutes rather than ten, like it's like yeah, okay, leaves, this like, might yeah, be like very right. like right. right. leaves, So I will not <laughs> do the one which is better in expectation yeah, so the, the because that is, doesn't. Get okay. Me. There might be some okay. very one-dimensional tweak that has a very sharp threshold function. The time, restaurants, hotels, like very unique. Okay, I think the more interesting extension is to have a multi-dimensional thing. Multi-dimensional is impossible, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is impossible. <laughs> this is trying to Okay. Yeah, that might be challenging. <laughs>